Rewind, your week in review, is sponsored by the Wisconsin Realtors Association, bringing Wisconsin communities to life with great homes, businesses, and neighborhoods. The Wisconsin Realtors Association, the voice of real estate. This week on Rewind, your week in review. They're gerrymandering 2.0. As promised, Governor Tony Evers vetoes Republicans' redistricting plan. We'll have the latest on how the courts plan to address the issue. And a Republican candidate for governor is suing the State Elections Commission. Plus, why a bipartisan bill to decriminalize small amounts of marijuana is getting resistance from some Democrats. All this and more on Rewind, your week in review for November 19th. Hi, I'm Emily Fannin. And I'm J.R. Ross. As you can see, me and J.R. Ross are in separate rooms just out of precaution. J.R. has a little bit of sniffles, but luckily a negative test. But we are just being careful because we are entering the holiday season, so we are separated. But that doesn't stop us here um, on Rewind, so we're going to continue uh, to talk about some of the biggest stories in politics this week. J.R., we're going to start off with redistricting. Um, as promised and as expected, Governor Tony Evers officially vetoed GOP redistricting plans. And in doing so, um, this now sets up the battle in the courts, um, who are almost certain to decide what the new district lines will look like for the next 10 years. Now, the Wisconsin Supreme Court is scheduled to resolve the case, they said, by November 30th, where they could, you know, either make major or minor changes to the current maps in place. Um, we'll get into some of the pending legislation, but first, let's just hear um, from a video message Governor Evers had to say um, when he vetoed uh, these GOP maps. But what's sitting in front of me here are gerrymandered maps modeled after the same gerrymandered maps we've had for a decade. Hundreds showed up on short notice to voice their opposition to these maps, and not a single member of the public testified in support of these bills at that public hearing. And they were sent out to my desk over the objections of a decade's worth of people in the state demanding better, demanding more, and demanding a fair nonpartisan process for preparing our maps for the next 10 years. Elected officials shouldn't be able to depend on the comfort of their seats instead of the quality of their work. And the gerrymandered maps Republicans passed a decade ago have enabled legislators to safely ignore the people who elected them. And these maps here, they're more of the same. They're gerrymandering 2.0. I promised I'd never sign gerrymandered maps that came to my desk, and I'm delivering on that promise today. This is just too important, folks. Our state deserves better, and we're going to keep working as long as I'm governor to bring fair maps to Wisconsin. Now, we didn't hear any reaction from GOP leaders after this veto because I'm sure they knew it was coming. But, Jair, we do know that the GOP proposed maps largely keep in place district lines that benefit their party. Democrats are going to court to hopefully make a lot of changes because they believe the current maps in place are gerrymandered and unfair. So I guess what can we expect to hear from the courts? We kind of got a signal from the state Supreme Court they're going to they're going to take up uh, and I guess by November 30th is what we're hearing um, to hopefully uh, start resolving this issue. Yeah, so the key timeline is this. On or around November 30th, the court's going to answer three questions that it asked the parties away on it. Two, one of those big questions was, should it take a least change approach to the maps the court eventually draws? Now that's the approach advocated by Republican lawmakers. They want these maps to look as much like the current ones as possible. The argument is that these maps in place right now are approved through the normal process where a bill was passed and signed by the then Governor Scott Walker. Therefore, you should not change it dramatically. You should sign this into law or reinforce this map. That's an approach opposed by Democrats. Another question is, should the court consider the partisan balance of these districts when it draws the map? That's something that Democrats want to be considered, right? They want this to be a quote-unquote fairer map what they have right now. So the court lays out that ruling on around the 30th. Then we go through a briefing schedule in the December, early January. The court said it uh, is reserving the possibility of an up to four-day trial in January if it needs it to take testimony. While that's going on, the federal court's saying, okay, we're going to kind of keep hanging back right now. Right before the state Supreme Court issued its order this week, uh, the federal court that's been as a similar district lawsuit said, okay, uh, we're going to delay things a little bit longer, keep wet, watch from the state Supreme Court, see what it does. Once the court issued its order, its timeline, that three-judge panel said, okay, now we're going to wait till at least January to do anything. 
One thing to keep in mind is even if the state Supreme Court ends up drawing these maps, which we expect, right, um, the federal court still has the opportunity to review them and look for any possible violations of federal law. So it's not necessarily that the Supreme Court is the last final absolute step on this process. What we have to watch is what map does the court draw or does it pick because that's also an option too, right? The court could decide to pick from the maps that are submitted by various parties and say this is the one we're going to go with or tweak a map that's been submitted. There can still be a federal lawsuit that challenges lines are drawn by the state Supreme Court. So this won't be done necessarily what the court has done, but it looks like, and I stress looks like, we're getting an answer sometime after the first of the year what this map's going to look like. And that's key because the Elections Commission says it needs these maps in place uh, by March 1st, roughly, to have 45 days of put in place the lines before the uh, candidates for the state legislature can start circulating nomination papers. That starts April 15th. So you see this timeline laying out now where it's getting to be almost like deadline time, have this stuff in place to get the 2022 elections on the road. And JR, um, I also want to bring up, how do you see the people's maps, which some Democrats are supporting? How do you see that map playing out in court? Because it was last week we saw a lot of uh, black and Hispanic lawmakers vote against those maps. Um, How could that impact uh, their chances in court? Well, it's interesting. I I talked to uh, Democrats last week about that whole scenario that played out on the floor of the assembly where there was a split in the caucus about the people's maps. Now, in the Senate, uh, Lena Taylor, a Milwaukee Democrat, she voted against the maps, raising the same concern about uh, black and Hispanic districts. They were not sufficient numbers, in her mind, to guarantee the black and Hispanic communities the opportunity to elect the candidate of their choice. On the assembly floor, the same thing played out. What my sources told me was there was actually a plan going into that floor vote where the caucus had talked about just voting no on everything, taking a no amendment uh, position, voting no on the governor's people's commission maps, knowing Republicans want to put them on the record, trying to give them a, a difficult spot on these maps and try to embarrass the governor. But when that started to happen, the governor's office began calling members and raising alarm bells because, well, Democrats have been calling for a nonpartisan commission for years to draw maps. Here one did, and now they're going to vote against the map. It, it blew their minds. So this kind of split developed. You had the speeches on the floor. And what I'm trying to get at is that now that we're going to the courts, the question is, will those concerns raised by black and Hispanic lawmakers during the debate end up in the legal filings? Because as you remember, we said, the court could pick from maps submitted. Well, if you have the governor submitting the People's Commission maps, which we expect him to, right? That's going to be his position. If he submits that map, you can see a scenario in which the courts say, okay, but we're getting arguments from Republicans saying these maps aren't valid because of A, B, and C. It might hurt, hurt the cause of the governor and trying the court to, to pick his map of the selections before the justices when it comes to that point in the case. All right, well, we'll be keeping tabs on the redistricting battle as it is now heating up, or will be heating up, I should say, in the courts. Um, uh, also want to bring up uh, who is a Republican candidate for governor, Rebecca Clayfish, this week, early this week on Monday, filed a lawsuit seeking to sue the Wisconsin Elections Commission over their guidance that was issued during the pandemic. In the suit, it specifically targets WEC's guidance on the use of drop boxes for absentee ballots, special voting deputies, and consolidating poll places. Now, this is a little bit of a different approach because we've seen Republicans, specifically Assembly Speaker Robin Voss, call for uh, commissioners to you know, possibly face felony fines for their guidance issue during the pandemic around similar issues. But Clayfish took the step to say, hey, let's resolve this in court. So um, I spoke to Representative Mark Spritzer um, of Beloit, a Democrat, about this. He sits on the Assembly Elections Commission. He actually was, you know, not surprised that there was a lawsuit filed, but was kind of okay to see this step being taken because he said, you know, let's stop the political arguments. Let the courts finally decide What's you know what should happen with this outcome? Should WEDC be making this guidance, or should they be promulgating rules here on out? So let's hear from arguments from Clayfish and Spritzer on this issue before we dive deeper into this new lawsuit. In Wisconsin, our state elections commission is tasked with administering our elections and ensuring laws are followed. Unfortunately, they failed in their duty creating confusion and causing trust in our election process to fall to an all-time low. That's why I am filing a lawsuit against the Wisconsin Elections Commission with the state Supreme Court. We saw the widespread introduction of unattended drop boxes that threaten the security of absentee ballots. 
the removal of special voting deputies, whose job it is to protect vulnerable voters in nursing homes, and the last-minute closure of polling places. This rogue guidance remains on the books today and is the basis of my lawsuit. Well, this is a Republican primary candidate trying to appeal to far-right Republican extremists uh, in her primary. So it's certainly not surprising. And uh, at least it is uh, more genuine than what Speaker Voss is doing, because going into court and getting a judge to say what the law is, is the appropriate way to handle these disagreements. And if that answer ultimately is that we can't have statewide guidance on things like ballot drop boxes, that is going to be really unfortunate because it will leave it up to the 1800 election officials that we have in Wisconsin to each make their own determination about things like drop boxes. Uh, and that is going to lead to a level of statewide chaos in future elections that uh, will be the unfortunate result of what Republicans are doing here. So, JR, I think it's important to note there's already a lawsuit pending in the Waukesha County Court seeking to ban the use of ballot drop boxes. We've also seen the Trump campaign and some other lawsuits last year challenging the use of drop boxes and overall the elections. But we heard justices when they decided to not take up some of those cases saying they want these lawsuits to be filed before an election happens, not after them. So can you kind of speak to the timing of this and and kind of weigh in on this lawsuit, how it differs from others. Sure. Uh, Clayfish is trying to find that sweet spot with the court uh, when the justices want to hear a case like this. Now, again, Trump filed his lawsuit too late, they say, and challenged the uh, guidance beforehand. There was an attempt this spring to get the court to take a case to ban drop boxes before the spring election. That was filed really close to the election itself. They're trying to find that kind of window when the justices may be open to taking a case and issuing decision because we are now less than a year out from the election. Now, a couple things to remember here. The state Supreme Court in the current configuration has been somewhat loath to take cases on original action. What that means is the court does not require a case to go through the lower courts first, the circuit court and appeals court before taking it. The Supreme Court then becomes basically a fact-finding body and the final arbiter of what's going on. Um, the court is only like that sometimes because the argument is that the court is not set to be a fact-finding body that's what the circuit court is for, that the Supreme Court should be about resolving these final big picture legal issues. So what I'm watching here is, will the court take this case, especially with a similar one pending before Waukesha Circuit Court about drop boxes filed by the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty? Now, there are a couple of nuances between the two lawsuits, however. Will wants the use of drop boxes banned, period. Clayfish wants the court to order the Elections Commission to issue its guidance through the administrative rules process on things like drop boxes and special voting deputies and the consolidation of polling places. Now, that also has another hurdle to it, though, is if the court were to order the Elections Commission to issue an administrative rule, which gives lawmakers uh, ins or authority over that pr proposal, you're assuming the Elections Commission actually could agree on a rule. Remember, it's a split 3-3 three, three between Democrats and Republican appointees. Uh, they have not gotten along in a lot of big picture items so far. So I'm kind of wondering, like, if the Supreme Court were to take this case, and we're a long way from that, if it took the case and ordered the commission to, uh, to a pro promulgate a rule, what then if they can't get on the same page about a rule? So a long way from now, but keep that in mind as this plays out, what that might look like down the road. And uh, speaking of elections, we also had a Republican representative, uh, Rantham, um, uh, kind of issue a resolution that we already know that will not get on the floor um, that we've heard from le leadership, but he was seeking to decertify the election results in Wisconsin, and he got praise. We've seen this many times by President Trump, um, and Trump likes to tweet, we know that, um, but in President Trump's tweet, he also um, falsely uh, claimed that the legislature needs one senator uh, to co-sponsor the resolution before it's voted on. And we know um, that's, that's not the case here in Wisconsin. So GOP leadership hasn't really weighed in yet, but we did hear from uh, Jim Steinecke say that he doesn't see this resolution going anywhere. So once again, we're seeing uh, J.R. Republicans trying to appease their base and trying to uh, please President Trump with their efforts that um, are, like ex this specific resolution is not going to go anywhere. No, and this is one more distraction for Republicans to talk about what they want to talk about, which they want to talk about inflation. They want to talk about Joe Biden's issues. And they want to talk about their perceived weaknesses of Tony Evers ahead of the 2022 election. Instead, you have this resolution, which, again, Legislative Council, which is the nonpartisan 
uh, legal arm of the legislature has said that there's no mechanism under state or federal law for Wisconsin to basically decertify the electoral votes or cast for Joe Biden. That's not going to happen. Number two, Tim Steinke, the Assembly uh, Majority Leader, said they're not taking the throw of you know, action on this in the Assembly. Uh, what is interesting to watch, though, is in President Trump's, former President Trump's statement, um, he said they need just one quote-unquote patriot in the Senate to step forward and co-sponsor it. Will somebody step forward and co-sponsor this resolution? As of Thursday morning, Rantham's office said nobody else has stepped forward in the Senate to co-sponsor it. Even if you do that, it doesn't guarantee you a vote, but it puts more pressure, if somebody did, to take it up. Again, leadership is saying they're not going to do this, but it's a distraction and it adds fuel to the fire for those who think the election was quote-unquote stolen to be talking about what lawmakers should be doing about 2020, but then talk about 2022. And don't forget, you also have this coming when you have the Racine County Sheriff recommending charging five of the six members of the Elections Commission, U.S. Senator Ron Johnson saying that the Republican lawmakers should basically declare that they're in charge of federal elections going forward and should ignore the Elections Commission. Now, uh, Justice Gableman, who's conducting that uh, review of the 2020 election, he issued an interim report last week. He says it's an open question uh, under state law if, if lawmakers could do that for federal elections. Um, problem for lawmakers is Republicans created the, government, or the, sorry, the Elections Commission and empowered it to run elections. That's going to be a tricky thing they try to take over federal elections. Robin Voss says they haven't studied it. Devin Lemmy, who says it's not something they sure is possible. But again, it's another distraction from like what they want to talk about and keeps that 2020 conspiracy theory alive. About you know, again, To be fair, Republicans also argue that um, they want to make sure there's integrity of our elections, that there were concerns about how elections were run last year. They point the Audit Bureau and the port it, it released and what's going on there. So there are issues to be talked about. But again, this is just a detraction from the bigger picture about 2022 and keeps that talk of 2020 alive well into next year. And I'm not sure the end is in sight for Republicans in the Capitol. That's what I was also going to mention, too. We often hear from Gableman and Republicans saying this is not about overturning the results of the election. This is about ensuring that elections going forward are safe and secure. Um, we don't see this ending anytime soon where people are like, hey, it's been a year since the election. These conversations are going to carry well over into next year. I think it's important to note like, when the timing of these discussions ever get resolved or if they will, they'll continue into you know, spring and autumn. Um, August primary. Are we still going to be talking about this? And that's something we'll definitely uh, be keeping an eye on if the conversation is still um, uh, fluid. Um, another note on elections uh, this week, uh, the city of Madison uh, sent out a memo that they are going to be requiring poll workers to be vaccinated. Now, this is a big issue for Republicans. And speaking of Clayfish, to kind of tie her back into this conversation, um, she was outright, you know, uh, outraged by this because she kind of insinuated that Republicans are less likely to be vaccinated. And Republicans uh, want their fair share to oversee elections and to be in the room and to be a, uh, a participant um, when observing or um, helping people vote. Yeah, so the city of Madison has a policy that if you are a city employee, uh, as of, I think, early August, you had to either be vaccinated or get tested weekly to continue your employment. Um, poll workers are technically city employees. They get paid for what they're doing. They are extending that requirement to uh, poll workers, inspector, inspectors, those kinds of folks who work the polls on election day. Now, key thing coming up is November 30th is actually the deadline for the political parties to submit to local officials a list of potential poll workers for next fall's elections. So Clayfish is trying to recruit um, additional Republicans to serve as poll watchers, poll, uh, uh, employees of the poll, poll workers, saying that this is something they needed to kind of keep an eye on things. What I'm watching for is, is there any kind of legal action that Republicans might take about this requirement, trying to challenge it? Might this cause any uh, consternation about that? So you have to keep an eye on it going forward. Uh, also, it plays into this theory from Republicans that when Democrats have a chance, they try to stack the rules against them to benefit Democrats in elections, and they're trying to say this is part of that, that effort that they think is unfair. 
All right, uh, now we're going to move on to COVID-19 and hospitalizations because right now trends are not looking particularly well in Wisconsin with cases on the rise and hospital beds uh, pretty high when it comes to capacity. Um, COVID-19 is surging uh, its cases. Um, it's similar to a surge that we've seen last fall. Um, I also mentioned hospitalizations are on, are on the rise. The current DHS data shows 96% of ICU beds are at full capacity. Um, it was the first time in several weeks that we heard from state health officials um, about uh, their, you know, uh, uh, COVID update. So we're going to hear from Dr. Ryan Westergaard, kind of just urging caution uh, to people to, you know, not let up, urging people to take some vaccinations uh, ahead of the holidays. We can't predict the future, but the trend we're seeing, I would say, from last week to this week is is very un, um, very concerning um, and something that we need to watch very closely because the, the slope of the curve looks similar to what we saw last fall. Uh, we hope that the peak isn't nearly as high. The biggest tragedy that we in our state and our system can 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 uh, will uh, need to try to prevent is having our capacity stretched so thin that we can't save lives that we normally would be able to save. A hopeful view of the future is that even if we don't get COVID-19 to go away, if this is something that we live with, we live with it as one of the many respiratory viruses that follow a seasonal variation. But because we're protected as a community through vaccination, it doesn't cause large amounts of severe disease. And uh, during this uh, call, there was a question asked uh, specifically about, is, is this going to be a trend we're going to see every fall? And Dr. Westergaard kind of thought so. Um, we saw this surge uh, last November. We're seeing again now, even though vaccinations are out there, um, we're now seeing uh, younger kids too. Uh, they're eligible to get the vaccine. Kids are back in school. So it's it's a little concerning right now, but I think it's uh, just goes to show that COVID's, COVID's not going anywhere. No, uh, remember the surge we're seeing right now is nowhere near where it was last November. That If you look at the chart of the spikes, the mountain that we saw, last fall was much higher. However, there wasn't a vaccine last fall. We we're getting to the point where we are in that, that booster window for some folks. It's a holiday season. There are concerns about this being a seasonal thing where we're gonna have it pop up you know, every so often, depending on where you're at in the country. So it's a time to be cautious. They're urging us at this point. What I'm watching is a couple of things. One, uh, does this spike die out quickly? Is it gonna be elongated? How does it affect uh, COVID-19 vaccination rates? We're still like around the mid 50s, I think. For overall population, it has been kind of stuck at a plateau for a long time now. So is there any movement on those fronts going forward about how we approach COVID-19 as a state and a society? And uh, what I'm also watching for, too, is just state health workers, too, are just a lot of them are leaving the profession because they're so burned out. Um, these hospital beds are filling back up again, too. Also, how the vaccine mandate will, um, you know, have possible implications on um, hospitals and how many staff workers that they'll have um, as the pandemic goes on. Uh, next up, I want to talk about uh, marijuana legislation. There was a bipartisan bill introduced this week to lower uh, marijuana possession fines across the state. Um, but when you look at the proposal, the fines would increase in some places like Milwaukee and Madison. That's because they have their own local marijuana possession ordinances in place. So the bill gets a little complicated, JR, depending where you light up and how much marijuana is in your possession, because under the bill, 14 grams or less, if you're caught with that much anywhere in the state, it would be about a $100 ticket. But if you have more than 14 grams, local ordinances apply. Like I mentioned, Milwaukee has one, Madison has one. Milwaukee right now, it's $1, so plus court fees. Uh, Madison uh, is, uh, I believe, is zero. Um, but you probably also have to play uh, court fines as well. So what's interesting, I think the biggest takeaway here, JR, is um, we'll hear from lawmakers defend this legislation, but we're seeing uh, Democrats in the Madison, Milwaukee area actually opposed to this because it would increase fines in their cities. We'll first hear from some of the bill sponsors defend this legislation and why it's necessary. I believe this bill that we have put together does our best to kind of pull together the best of both worlds, try to bring together all perspectives across the state to try to find some sort of middle ground where we can move forward. And we've had 
good discussions with many people in law enforcement, many, many people in the business community, mm -hmm. and we have not had any real pushback from anybody. Um, a lot of them can't quite decide what they want to do with it because it is a little bit unique, and it's a, it's a middle ground approach that nobody has really tried yet. So when people are confused about how the laws apply within Patchworks, that makes it harder. So, you know, I've had discussions with uh, cannabis advocates. I've had this discussion with numerous people. We understand it's worth a trade-off, and that's coming from the person who actually made it $1 in Milwaukee County. We, and the repeat offense also. We know that for that um, reason alone, um, the damage that um, this th that small amounts of marijuana is being considered as a felon felony in our state, it's worth a trade off. So I spoke to uh, Senator Calda Royce and Senator Melissa Agard. They both told me they are not going to sign on to this bill. And if it does go through the committee process, they will, and it goes on the floor, they're going to vote against it because they just can't support something where it's going to increase fines on their constituents. Well, it's interesting. The backers are saying this is a, a compromise because nobody gets a real win out of this bill, right? The people who are hardliners who don't want to legalize marijuana at all, uh, don't get a true win. The people who want full legalization don't get a true win. Well, what, when nobody gets a win, there's also not really a big incentive to get on board with a compromise like this, especially when it doesn't do much for your local constituents in Milwaukee, Madison. So I'm kind of in, perplexed a little bit by the approach of the bill. I mean, I get the argument that it's a compromise, but there's no incentive to get behind it for anybody who's on different sides of the debate. Um, also, remember, uh, Robin Voss, the Assembly Speaker, he got some attention a while back when he said he was open to the idea of medicinal marijuana, but he's not indicating any openness to recreational legalization. Uh, Devin Lemahue, the Senate Majority Leader, has said that his caucus is not there on medicinal marijuana. He has said at an event we had in April that he wants to see the FDA approve medical marijuana before they even took it up in the state. There's not a movement there. Uh, I'm watching, there's uh, some pockets in the Republican caucuses who are supportive of medical marijuana or even full legalization. Um, I'm watching to see if there's a bill that comes up again that would address medical marijuana. The backers would want to have a conversation, at least get it out there for a conversation on legalization of medical marijuana. I don't know if they'll get a full committee hearing though to even get that going because there is such opposition in some circles in the Republican caucuses. Because to them, remember, we're a lot of safe seats in the legislature. They're worried about the base and primary. The base is not there. They're not there philosophically. It's just not going anywhere in a Republican-controlled legislature. And we've also seen Governor Evers uh, try even sneaking some medical marijuana, full legalization, um, other avenues through his budget, and Democrats have introduced their own bills. But like you mentioned, uh, most of them don't even get a, a public hearing at all. Um, uh, we're running out of time, so I'm actually going to move on to our last topic this week is about uh, DPI released their school report cards. Um, th now, these are the first ones uh, assessing Wisconsin's uh, schools uh, before the pandemic began. So the report cards measure a school's progress on things like test scores, attendance, equity, and like I mentioned, they were not conducted in 2020 because of the pandemic. So here's just a brief overview of what the results show of schools that received scores about 87 and met or exceeded expectations in the 2020-2021 school year. And that same, that's the same percentage as it was in the 18 and 19 school year. So the scores are partially based on a student's progress on standardized tests for math and language arts. Um, and, you know, this uh, also uh, falls into um, some of the opposite, you know, once these results came out, we heard from Senator Alberta, our, excuse me, Senator Alberta Darling say, we knew kids were struggling during the pandemic. These tests just confirm that. Instead of offering solutions, Governor, Evo, Governor Evers is vetoing real reforms that help kids. Now, that is a response to Evers' veto on Senate Bill 454, which would establish a new reading readiness assessment for grade schoolers. But J.R. Dem say more testing won't prove anything and that teachers and school officials, uh, they already know this. They want more resources. They want more funding, not more assessment. So I guess what are some of the key takeaways that you um, learned from this uh, new assessment of schools? Remember, uh, DPI tweaked some of the standards in reaching these assessments. Um, so the goalposts were moved a little bit and we still didn't see much progress. So that's a red flag for some Republicans that there's something going on here. Um, I guess what I'm watching going forward is what's going to be the push for change. Right now, we have a standoff between a Democratic governor and a Republican state legislature. If there is a Republican governor in 2023, you could see things maybe moving more in the direction of what Republicans have proposed. But I'm just not seeing a 
bridge between the two sides right now and any big changes to education. But again, I, I think there's just a little bit of suspicion among Republicans about these test scores and what they mean because don't forget, a lot of kids didn't take them uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so there's some question about how, how much you should put into these test scores. There's also a line from DPI this week that, look, because of how this thing all played out, keep that in mind when you try and read a lot into these scores. Uh, so I'm really watching what happens next year. Of course, next year's scores won't be out until after next year's election. So keep that in mind too. All right, well, that will do it for this week. Just a quick note, we will be taking a break next week, so we won't have a rewind show because of the holiday break, but we will re be returning on December 3rd. So we hope to join you then. For now, I'm Emily Fannin. And I'm J.R. Ross. We'll see you in a few weeks. Take care. Rewind, your week in review, is sponsored by the Wisconsin Realtors Association, bringing Wisconsin communities to life with great homes, businesses, and neighborhoods. The Wisconsin Realtors Association, the voice of real estate.